So today's speaker is Professor Jennifer Burrick Pierce, Associate Professor in the School of Library and Information Science and the Center for the Book at the University of Iowa. Dr. Burrick Pierce writes about changes in media for young readers, creating histories of moments in media use that reflect important developments either in library history or contemporary culture. Her latest book, Narratives, Nerdfighters, and New Media, was published in 2020 by the University of Iowa Press, a book that one reviewer called of such compelling interest that it will find a general readership alongside an enthusiastic academic one. So whichever of those categories you find yourself in, I hope you will take a look at it. Welcome, Dr. Burrick Pierce. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me and for your introduction and for your attention. So let me, I'm going to go back and forth between slides and actual live books. So we'll be bouncing back and forth a bit, but let me start uh, with some screen sharing and, uh, and start talking you through what we've got here. All right, so the title of my talk is Children's Lit is Serious Business or Children's Books are Serious Business. And this title comes from a first year seminar that I did uh, uh, several years ago. And um, this photo is from the first time I ran that seminar, the first time that I brought them into special collections, which as you can tell, they, they greatly enjoyed. Um, so, some of the things that I would talk about with them, some of the themes that shaped that class that I'm going to use as touchstones for our conversation here tonight are some of the motives that we have had for taking children's books seriously. And these include uh, the, the awards they win, uh, the times when they are seen as moral threats and are become targets of censorship, um, they have become a considerable force in contemporary publishing. It's one of the areas in recent years that has seen growth and, uh, and fairly consistent profits. Um, books uh, for children can be lovely because of the way they talk to children. Um, they are sometimes interesting because of their status and value as rare historical objects. And of course, they are um, of interest sometimes because they have lasting influence through our lives. Um, I suppose I should do slide view. You're, I, I always run my slides this way. It's easier for me to see what I'm doing, but um, when I move into the images, I'll, I'll maximize screen sharing and, and shift the view. So before I start uh, sharing lots of different children's books with you, one of the things that I thought would be useful is to stop for a moment or two and talk about what makes something a children's book. How do we define a children's book? And so one of the things that's interesting about children's books is that the definition has to do with the reader. So, I mean, we know what a romance novel is because of what's inside the book sci-fi fantasy books, you know, they're, they're things that we, or genres that we define by their contents. But children's books are different. We don't define them by their content, we define them by their audience, by who reads them. And so uh, if you go into the literature, and that would include um, Miggs's Critical History of uh, Children's Literature, which is an older and classic work, or Seth um, Lehrer's Children's Literature, which is a far more recent treatise. They basically talk about children's literature as either works that are actually written for children or works that are written, um, or works that are read, sorry, by them, regardless of who the author's intended audience is. And to give you one example of things in that latter category, uh, the Anne of Green Gables novels these days are often seen as something for tween or early teen readers. When those were published, those were adult novels. They were intended for um, adult readers. So there's often that type of shift. So one of the things though that I would point out to you, uh, regardless of this two-pronged definition, is that what is regarded as appropriate or suited to young people varies with both time and place. And that'll generate um, some of the points that I'll be talking about with you. Some other things to be aware of or to sort of have in mind when we're thinking about what children's lit is, um, 
there are people, critics, uh, specialists in this area, and they basically think that in illustrations are integral. It, you know, they basically are a sort of scoff. It, well, it, could it really be a children's book if it doesn't have pictures? And so, one of the things that I think is interesting about this sort of expectation, this increasingly normalized expectation that children's books are in some way, shape, or form illustrated, is that that unlike a novel where we have a single author on the cover as the person who is responsible for creating it, um, when we deal with children's picture books, those have, they are at minimum the creation of two people, the author and illustrator. So, um, all right, so I want to talk to you and show you a couple of award winners. Many of the books that I'm going to talk about and show you are award winners, so I'm only going to uh, pause and do a couple of award winners proper where I'm not talking about them for other reasons. Um, and so one of them is this, um, Wangari Matai, The Woman Who Planted Millions of Trees. And this is a lovely, I mean, the illustrations in this book are just, I think, exquisite. Um, the, the cover is a little glossy, so I was trying to um, get some of the, the more matte interior pages so that you can, can see a bit of the illustration. But this has, this is translated from the French and the, the number of awards, oh, lovely. Let's see if we can do this with that reflection. But you can see on its back cover, just tons and tons of, of critical praise from all sorts of outlets and at least four different awards, including an Amelia Bloomer list and a um, Mighty Girl book for, for young children. So this, this story of a Kenyan activist is among the um, award winners in recent years. I have an older um, award winner and I'm like sitting here going, okay, quick, double check the uh, the, copyright date on the Versa. Yeah, so this is um, a visit to William Blake's Inn, Poems for Innocent and Experienced Travelers. It's from 1981, and it too has won multiple awards. So if you are familiar with the poetry of William Blake, uh, this is someone who has used his themes to create uh, children's poetry um, and help them learn about William Blake and or his themes. But of course, you know, we've, we've got cats and teacups, we've got dragons, we've got, we've got all sorts of lovely, lovely images. So a couple of, I think, lovely illustrations and, um, but also compelling text for, for those two books. So from there, I think I'll, I think I need to move back into my slides. Oh wait, that won't. <laughs> I need to share my screen with you before I do something wild and crazy like moving back into my slides. All right, so so those are a couple of um, award winners. One very recent, and one somewhat less so. Um, and they engage in different ways. One of the reasons that I wanted to show you the poems for innocent and experienced travelers, because I think it speaks to a theme, a continuing concern and interest of uh, people who share children's books with young readers or decide that they are not going to share children's books with young readers. And that is the theme of childhood innocence. Um, I think there exists this popular idea that, that somewhere at some time, childhood was more protected, more innocent, less fraught than it is in the present moment. Um, and I've got here for you one quote of a librarian who was writing to her peers in uh, 1915. It is not surprising that one often hears a sigh for the golden age of childhood where there is where there are no cares, where all is freedom, fun, and frolic. And of course, the extent to which this might define any childhood of any era very much has to do with 
who that child is, that child's socioeconomic circumstances and more. But it, it, it you know, and I've given you an example here from 1915, I think it remains a, a concern and an interest uh, that, that generates friction about some children's books. So yes, want to talk to you about censored uh, books for young readers. One of the things that you may or may not be aware of is that books for younger readers are the majority of what is challenged in US public and school libraries. Uh, one of the trends particularly that has emerged since about 2015 is that books with diverse content, particularly ones that have LGBTQ themes or authors, are, uh, had started to dominate the uh, list that ALA compiles of books that are most frequently challenged in this country. Um, one author whose work appears on this list is best-selling award-winning Indianapolis author, John Green. Um, his book, and I suppose I can, let's see, I'm sure you can see, you can see me, you can see, see the book without uh, stopping sharing I, my screen here. Um, yeah, so this is his first novel, Looking for Alaska, um, that is, people discuss variously, is, is this the uh, smoke of a candle going out or is this the, the smoke of a cigarette? And I guess it depends um, which side of the uh, cover, whether you're on the front or back cover, which you might be inclined to see it as. Um, but this is a book, it's his first book uh, published in 2005, and it has the rationale um, or one of the reasons that it is banned is one of the most common. It is uh, regarded often by complainants as unsuited to age group, uh, which is a category that ALA uses as sort of a catch-all for for the complaints. Um, ALA basically sort of does decade compilations of the books that are most frequently challenged during a 10 year period. Um, between 2000 and 2019, Looking for Alaska was number four on that compilation list, but it had, and it's been that way because it's been there repeatedly over and over again. And um, I'm not going to take you to his video right now, but um, it was first challenged in 2008, and John Green made a video in response. And I'll, I'll make these slides available to you so that if you're inclined to follow that path, that you will um, be able to see it. Um, so one of his other books, uh, The Fault in Our Stars, came out in 2012, in 2014 was the year of the movie release. And that, as, as is often the case, if you've got a medium that makes a book more accessible, it tends to draw more attention to it. So in 2014, there was a California school district that decided that they were going to, to ban this book, that it was not going to be allowed in their school library, their junior high school library. They decided that the sexual activity and other topics in this book made it inappropriate for that particular age group. That said, there are also people who, um, you know, because his work is so visible and attracts this type of attention, there are other people who will gather together and form statements opposing, you know, attempts at censorship like that. So um, I'm going to stop sharing screen and um, show you some John Green books. Um, so this one is interesting. Part of the reason I have this is because when he, he used to describe his books as some things that sold moderately. Um, and so he told people when this one was coming out, he told people on his YouTube audience that he would sign the entire first edition. So of course it sold out. So that is, is what we have here is one of the books that he signed as part of that endeavor. Um, of course, there were other reasons that that book became wildly popular. And so there are other editions. So this one, oh, working on the whole, how do I not, not get um, glare on the screen so that you can see the books. Uh, so this is a Project for Awesome special 
edition. And so the Project for Awesome is an annual charity fundraiser that he and his brother have been doing since 2007. And coincidentally, this year, uh, the, the Project for Awesome uh, charity fundraising began today. Um, so I've got a special edition from that endeavor. Um, the other piece that I have that's kind of interesting is uh, the work and Imperial Affliction. If you are familiar with the, uh, the Fault in Our Stars, you know that there is a book within a book that the, the teenage protagonist is interested and loves this book called An Imperial Affliction by Peter Van Houten. And that this book is sort of a catalyst for a lot of the action in the story. And so when they made the movie, they had to have a book that the um, that Hazel would read that would get handed around to um, other people who were interested and wanted to read it. So yes, there were extra copies of those movie props, pet perks for contributing to the P4A and that's how I happen to have this particular copy. So that is, uh, some of John Green's materials that I have, some of the John Green materials that I have here. Um, and of course, John Green is a best selling author, um, but he is, of course, not the only best selling author. And so I wanted to talk with you about an author who has been a considerable commercial force in children's. Uh, publishing in uh, contemporary years. And so that would be J.K. Rowling and the Harry Potter series. Um, one of the things, of course, that has made this more complicated is her commentary on Twitter about trans people and other issues. Uh, this has led some people to be less interested in the stories to feel that they don't want to reward her commercially uh, for those statements. Um, it has not apparently affected her brand that much. Uh, her most recent book is called The Ichabog, and I, I don't have a copy of that to share with you, but I did double check the New York Times bestseller list. And basically it has been on the New York uh, bestseller list for about 12 weeks, which would be more or less continuously since it was uh, released. Um, but the Harry Potter series is something with tremendous commercial power. Um, it was, you know, as it caught hold and really captured interest, there were, if, if you were sort of following the literature, you know, there were interests, there were people who were sort of always hoping to find the next Harry Potter. That's, that's the way um, looking for the next successful children's work was sometimes talked about. Um, it's also interesting because its start was fairly ordinary. There was nothing. If you go back into the reviews and other things, there wasn't a whole lot that said, wow, this is going to be a thing that dominates bestseller lists. And it did dominate bestseller lists. Basically, the New York Times restructured its bestseller list like three times to try to keep it from dominating its, uh, its lists of bestselling books. But when you, when you go back to its initial reviews and things, it looks like a positive but ordinary start. Um, there wasn't a lot of buzz that it was going to be an award winner or, or anything like that. Um, it was readers that basically create the power, the commercial power of this book. And it's readers talking to readers, readers recommending it to other readers. The first award that Harry Potter won was in the UK. It's the Nestle Smarties Book Prize. And children have a role in selecting the finalists for that uh, particular prize. So one of the, the things that's really interesting about the Rowling books is that you sort of see them move from bestsellers to the creation of all these collectible editions. And um, one of the most recent series redesigns was Brian Selznick's illustration. And, um, you know, 
I'm not going to try and follow all the links now, but they, there's a whole series of these books. And I think I've got some of them. So I'll stop sharing and show you what I've got here in the way of Harry Potter. All right. <laughs> They're heavy. Um, so one of the, sorry, one of the recent, rel I, everything's recent. I've hit the age where everything's recent. If it didn't happen in, a, in uh, two, you know, half a century ago, it's recent. Uh, but they started issuing the books as in illustrated editions. They're, um, and these are really well regarded in terms of the way they depict and visually realize the story. Um, there is illustration on so many of its pages, whether that's McGonagall, um, and, and reading the map, learning her, her way around, um, Harry under in his room, his cupboard, under the stairs, um, you know, and, and so many other things. So, and of course, it's also got one of those uh, place marker ribbons that allows it to look uh, classy and classic. Uh, so there's more than one of these that they've, they've gone through, I think at least three in the series, but that's one thing, one of the reissues of Harry Potter. Um, another of the recent issues of Harry Potter are the house editions. So you can, if you've sorted yourself using any of the various online tools, uh, for the 20th anniversary of the series, they released a uh, set of, of only like the, the first book in the series, but they released them with house colors and motifs. It's primarily like the, the wrap around the packaging rather than the interior, but of course, cute and fun. Um, as the books became more successful and more popular, they started printing more of them. So first editions of the later books, like this is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. So this would be the last. Um, this, you know, this is one of the ones where there would be a, a fair amount of reprinting, you know, not exactly hard to find. The reason I have this one is that this is the UK first edition rather than the American first edition. Um, so there is that. Um, to go back to slides. Um, one of the other things that's sort of distinctive and interesting about the Harry Potter books is that when there was such reader demand for more Harry Potter, one of the things that they did, uh, that J.K. Rowling did, is started releasing editions of the books that her characters read, the things that Hermione read in the library, the, the textbooks that they had at school, and things like that. And so one of those books then is the Tales of Beetle the Bard. And the reason that I'm showing you this one on screen is because this is uh, the special collections edition. This is a special edition that was created as part of a charity fundraiser. And the part that you're seeing is designed to look like a book, but this is actually a case for the book and the book itself is inside. Um, it has a velvet pouch, it has this ornate um, decoration on its cover and it emulates in the way that it is typeset and everything, the handwritten edition that, that she created. Um, she had, I think, seven versions that she uh, created as handwritten books. She gave them to people like her publisher as thank yous, but one copy in particular was auctioned off to raise funds for a children's charity. And so, so other editions that were, had a much, much lower price point and were more available to us were, um, were made. And that's what's um, in special collections. And this one's interesting. It's not just that it's glitzy and kind of fun and um, it's, it's designed to emulate an older style of book. And there's one in special collections that we often use is the comparison point, but 
fortunately for, for all of us, there was a new ad acquisition that was shared uh, via the Special Collections Instagram account recently. And I think it's nice in terms of allowing you to see that decorative metal work on an older book that this style is emulating. Um, the newest version, oh, stop share. <laughs> Uh, the newest version is sort of a companion to the illustrated versions of the, the Harry Potter books. And I, I think it's lovely. To me, this really sort of captures the sensibilities of the stories. Uh, there are some pen and ink illustrations inside it, but there are also, you know, some of, of the full color illustrations inside it as well. All right, so that, that is Harry Potter. Uh, let's see what else I can show you. I still have stacks of books behind me, so certainly there's more. Um, yeah, so this redesign, basically it envisions new audiences and of course it makes money. Um, some of the redesigns of uh, the Harry Potter covers, for example, are designed to make it more appealing, more suited to adult readers. If you've seen the original covers, uh, they're, they're very much something that signals a young reader, but it has adult readers. It is um, one of the examples of what we call a crossover novel. And so basically it was reissued also with a different cover that made it look more adult when adults are sitting there reading this book on the, the subway on their way into work and things like that. Um, she is, of course, not the first commercial success. Sorry, grabbing more books here. Um, if you've heard people complain that in some respects, the Harry Potter stories don't always seem super original, I would tell you that those are probably people who've read boarding school books, that one of the genres that Harry Potter participates in is this genre of the boarding school books. And so one of the people who has written those is a British author named Enid Blyton. She has um, a number of series, two of them that deal with the boarding school experience are Mallory Towers and St. Clair's. Um, and these are books where, you know, that, that, that's, um, that thing that happens in Harry Potter, we're waiting for the start of school, we're catching the train to school, we're meeting new friends, we're learning about the rules, we're getting in trouble, you know, like all of that happens in these books. And so the only um, Enid Blyton that I have to show you, and they're, you know, these are, they do have some illustrations, but these are about the story, about the narrative, but I've got um, one of the, the oak, um, the, uh, St. Clair series, which is uh, sitting here in, in French. So I've got that version instead of any of the English versions to, to show you. Um, all right, let me see what else I want to share with you. Um, I think I need to go back to sharing the screen to move us. Okay, so in addition to books that kids enjoy and buy, there are of course all sorts of books that provide the message that kids are special. And I have a few different examples here, one from special collections and then a couple others um, that I use for teaching that I'll show you. And I'm gonna grab tea. Sorry, really quick so that I can keep talking to you. All right, so there is this charming book that was published for the first time in 1930. Special Collections has both the first picture book and the second uh, picture book by this um, author illustrator duo. This is, it's Mary Steichen Martin is listed as the creator, but if you look at the um, title page that's here, you'll see that the photographs are by Edward Steichen. And so that name perhaps sounds familiar to you. And that would be because he is, was, sorry, one of the preeminent photographers, one of the people who 
does photography in a way that um, enables it to be understood as art. He, um, he had a lot of different roles, but one of them, you know, is at the age of 68, basically, he became director of photography at the Museum of Modern Art. And so you've got someone of this prominence whose art is basically used to illustrate a wordless, come on, let's go. There we go, a wordless picture book. And, you know, this, this one, of course, is the clock, but there's a lot of different images, you know, the teddy bear, the spoon, you know, things like that, things that would be found around the house. And I think it's lovely. And I, there's this quote about how he uh, thinks about photography. And he said um, on his, this is apparently when he was interviewed on his 90th birthday, he said, the mission of photography is to explain man to man and each man to himself. And that is no mean function. Man is the most complicated thing on earth and also as naive as a tender plant. So I thought that was a sort of a fun quote uh, that talks about sort of why this sort of project might have appealed to him. Other titles that um, I think offer nice messages and nice sort of concepts of childhood. Uh, let's see, some of the are things that I use in class. So this, I, supp I suppose I can stop sharing and then there's more screen real estate for these uh, picture books. Yeah, so this is a 2019 book called Where Are You From? And as you might expect, it is about a young girl who uh, winds up being asked that question by her classmates and playmates. Where are you from, they ask. Is your mom from here? Is your dad from there, they ask. I'm from here, I, from today, same as everyone, I say. No, where are you really from, they insist. And what a day for my pages to stick together. And then she comes home and she says, I ask Abuelo because he knows everything. And like me, he looks as if he doesn't belong. And he thinks, his eyes squint like he's looking inside his heart for an answer. You come from the pampas, the open free land, he says. And so this is just really delightful about turning that question that can be so hurtful into an affirmation. Um, another book, this is A Hat for Mrs. Goldman, written by... Um, our local author, Michelle Edwards, uh, this is a signed copy, but this is a really, beyond its charming illustrations, it's a really lovely story about empathy, about understanding people's needs and about giving. And of course, it is a story where the child is the one who is the giver. Um, another one that I like to use um, and that my students usually seem to enjoy when, in, when I use it is Barack Obama's of Thee I Sing, A Letter to My Daughter. And this is a book, you know, that of course hearkens to some of our, um, you know, our, our longstanding national uh, tropes, but basically it's used as a way of talking about diversity and not just diversity in terms of skin color or ethnicity, it's about people's traits, the skills that they can contribute to, uh, to our society. And, and he does this by highlighting a whole bunch of different um, Americans. So let me take us back to my slides. Um, Subject and influence. Of course, I've given you like a lot of the warm and fuzzy books, but of course, not everything that is published and marketed or um, otherwise targeted to young readers is has has such warm and fuzzy subjects. So, one of the books that is held in special collections is a 1938 book called The Nazi Primer, and it is basically what it sounds like. So, if I um, 
let me grab the language from some of the early reviews. Um, the Nazi Primer is a book used for regimenting 7 million boys and girls between the ages of 10 and 14 years and is intended to continue the home and grammar school training in the, the Nazi ideology. Um, and the people who talk about this book noted, if the uh, this quote of Hitler, something Hitler said, if the older generation cannot get used to us, says Hitler, we will take away the children and rear them in their spirit. And so this book is part of that ideology, part of that effort to normalize uh, this destructive ideology. Um, you can see this is the translated edition and the preface is offering some of that context. Um, inside it, you've got a lot of graphics and visualizations that are designed to persuade younger teen readers uh, that the, the particulars of the Nazi philosophy and ideology um, that they have a logical basis as opposed to being bias and hatred and, and other things. And so you can see some of the graphs and charts uh, that are used to convey that message to try to make it seem logical and appropriate to younger readers. Um, some of the additional titles, and I know, I think I saw, okay, I have to get books that are behind me. The next books are behind me. Um, I think I saw Jennifer uh, join us and she was in my resources for children's class in the fall. And she read this other things by this author, but I haven't read, I uh, hadn't read this particular title until Jennifer uh, found it and brought it up for, for discussion uh, when we were looking at materials for, um, for older uh, for young, young readers, but like more like teens and, or, you know, people in their early teen years. So this piece is really interesting. It's called Undefeated, Jim Thorpe and the Carlisle Indian uh, School football team. And so if, it's about the noted athlete, Jim Thorpe, and about how he and numerous other Native American young people were removed from their homes with their families and sent to these boarding schools where they were basically Americanized. Their, their hair was cut, they were given anglicized names. Um, and, and his story of course is an interesting one, one with multiple tensions because of course he has tremendous prowess as an athlete. He helps, you know, this, um, he helps his uh, boarding school football team win against greatly competitive people. But of course, there is a tremendous personal cost. And so this is a research uh, work that, that tells that story. Um, I've also got this piece. It's described as a fifth impression or edition instead of a reprint. But this is Hair Joins the Home Guard. So it was originally published in Britain in 1941. And so this is basically a book that is about explaining the war effort to young British children in the 1940s. Um, you know, go and each page goes through a different facet of, of the war effort. Um, you know, so, so some of the darker or more serious uh, ways that, that children's books are, are shaped. Um, another thing that makes children's books interesting is of course, kids aren't always the best caretakers of books that if they, they love books, they sometimes love books hard or for, they forget them in places and they get lost or, or written, you know, things happen to children's books. And so when books survive um, childhood, uh, there sometimes aren't that many. So that creates the, the issue of scarcity or, and then they can become more collectible. So I have a few examples of some of these kinds of books, which are over on the far table, sorry. All right, so um, this is sort of a modern book published by Random House, written by Dare Wright. There is a series of lonely dolls. This one is The Lonely Doll Learns a Lesson. And so this is of course a copy that I 
had when I was a young child. And of course, I found the lonely doll absolutely fascinating. And because my mother was a librarian, my copy survived childhood. <laughs> um, other books that are sometimes collectible are the little golden books. These were books that um, were designed basically to be affordable. Oh, yay, someone else has them too, the pokey little puppy. Yes, that was my brother's, we, we used to have that. Um, and Leonard Marcus has written a book about this. So there's, there's a lot more that can be said, but yes. So a couple of the little golden books. Um, that can often be fairly collectible and fairly pricey. Um, another one that's modern, um, let's see, I'm spacing this, and I, this is embarrassing because I have just written an essay that involves this book. This book is, I think, from the 1940s. Yay, it does, and it doesn't have its publication information on the verso so that I can quickly consult it. Um, but yeah, so this is, and it's got the Mylar cover on it to help protect its um, fragmenting cover. But this is a book called The Keystone Kids. It's by a man named uh, John R. Tunis. And he was wildly popular. Ke the teens loved these books and critics loved his books. They thought that the, they were pretty well written. They thought that the messages that he sent to teens about good citizenship and um, accepting people and being honest and things like that. So, so uh, adult reviewers love them and teens love them. Part of the reason I know about this book is because I've been researching a librarian who probably was one of the first people to do an author visit in her library in order for teens to come in and meet this author that they liked. And so um, that woman was Beatrice Schein and she was with the Newark Public Library. This happened in the 1940s. And uh, this was the author that, that she invited so that uh, young people would have a, an enjoyable conversation with him. So um, I guess I've arrived at my last few slides. And there are a number of people who talk in flowery language about the lasting influence of children's books, about how the books we read and enjoy when we're young stay with us through our lives. Um, and I found recently a variation on that quote that I thought I would share with you as, as one of my final slides for this evening. And that is from Stacey Abrams. And she says, my mother, a librarian for most of my childhood had taught us how books shaped our sense of the possible. For me and for other black girls, I wanted to write books that showed them to be as adventurous and attractive as any white woman. And so of course, um, in the biographical information that we've heard about Ms. Abrams recently, uh, one of the things we know is of course that among her other accomplishments that she has written a number of novels, romance adventure novels in which she tried to carry out that aim. So, ta-da.